So um, I'm going to start off with, this is an image of some illuminations in Cleveland. <laughs> Um, and this is actually a, a moving train. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because it's so easy to take lighting um, for granted. Um, you know, we're, it's really great at this time of year where you have um, lots of lights lighting up the dark sky. But it's very easy to forget how far technology has moved on and how ubiquitous coloured lighting is now and what you can actually do in domestic setting. Um, and I thought it'd be quite apt as well to have a train because um, of Brunel. <laughs> um, so this is a photograph of um, the opening of the bridge, which is probably very familiar to quite a few of you. And I'm not sure, I'd need to do some more research into this, but this might be the first use, first public use of electric lighting in Bristol. I'm not sure. Um, so as part of the opening ceremony in the evening, they had electric lights on the top of the piers and the middle of the chains. Um, and they also had magnesium flares and limelight at the base of the piers, at the base of the towers. I'm just going to um, read out a little um, description of the event. Okay, the illumination, though successful from a scientific point of view, failed to afford that amount of gratification to the public which had been anticipated. And universal disapprobation seems to have been engendered in all quarters which we visited. The illumination of the bridge by the electric and other lights had been looked forward to as being one of the most interesting and novel sights of the day. The illumination was conducted under the superintendence of Mr. Phillips of Western Supermare. And the means employed were an electric light on top of each pier and two others in the centre of the bridge, two limelights at the base of each pier and four magnesium lamps, intermediate positions on the roadway and lit at intervals. And when the whole of these were brought to bear upon the bridge, the effect was very striking. This effect, however, was but seldom accomplished as the whole of the lights were more or less of an intermittent character whilst the magnesium lights were, at an early stage of the illumination, discarded in consequence of the difficulty experienced in keeping them alight through the strength of the wind and so exposed to the position. At times the effect of the light was exceedingly brilliant, the rays being distinctly pencilled and elongated, and all the outlines and tracery of the bridge were rendered clearly visible, while at others the lights presented a dim disappearance and caused great disappointment. Towards nine o'clock, the great bulk of the people began to return to the city. So it's a bit of a mixed response, and the magnesium flares were hard to keep going. Um, it, unfortunately, I don't know who Mr. Phillips, Western Supermare was. He might have been the pottery owner there, but I don't know what sort of electric source they were using, what kind of lighting they're using whether it's um, electric arc lamps. Um, so it's, it's quite hard to know, imagine what it would have been like, but at least we've got a nice um, description of it, even if it was disappointing for, for the general population. Um, it wasn't really until the 1890s, in fact, 1893, when the first public electricity supply to Bristol was supplied. Um, and in, by 1898, there were electric arc lamps in Clifton. And I think there, well, my notes say that there are still 52 grade two lamp posts still in Clifton. So if you walk around, you might be able to find them. Um, so from when the bridge opened, the main source of light was gas. Um, it, the Bristol Gas Light Company had been formed in 1815, but here we have the evidence of gas lighting on the bridge. You can see we've got um, lamps on the longitudinal girders here and also mounted on the chains in the middle of the bridge. Um, I'm not entirely sure when they were removed or whether the middle ones were removed at some point. Um, 
Well, I do know there isn't that much in the sources, but I do know that the company did their own lighting up rather than the city of Bristol. Presumably, I also I know that um, at night time the bridge was shut. So there would have been some hours of darkness, but the bridge wouldn't have been open throughout the whole of the night. Um, and presumably carriages, horse carriages, would have had their own lamps tied on. So they would have had their own means of seeing their way across the bridge. So we have, um, we have two double gas mantle fittings at the centre of the main span, four single standards attached to the longitudinal girders, and there are also four single standards located on the corner blocks of the parapets of each pier, and four at the junctions of the main deck and the abutments, and four standards on the masonry parapet blocks beside the pedestrian turnstiles at each toll house. So there were 24 gas lighting units on the bridge. And then also at later date, single column standard street gas lamps were located at the curb edge outside the toll house and large lanterns were also fitted under the road arches of both piers. There was a little bit in the newspapers from, um, there was a notice saying that the company were contacted by the Pyramid Electric Lighting Company in 1879 to see whether they could carry out experiments of um, using electric light on the bridge. Um, presumably, I don't know, again, I don't know <laughs> what kind of light it would have been, um, but Swan about this time would have been developing more commercial um, forms of lighting. Um, so I don't know whether it's incandescent or arc lighting. Um, unfortunately, the company didn't reply to the Pyramid Electric Lighting Company, but they did do a demonstration down in the docks to show the power of electric lighting. Um, but as I mentioned before, electric street lighting didn't really um, become established until the 1890s. Okay, so like my first photograph, lighting is obviously there to help you see your way in the dark, but it's also for celebrations. Um, and the bridge was lit up in 1902. It was lit up with 3,600 fairy lights. 424 flambeaux, which is type of um, flares, and 280 Roman candles, and 380 pounds of coloured fire. And this was to celebrate the coronation of Edward VII. I haven't actually got um, an image of that, um, but this is a postcard dating from 1908 when the bridge was lit up again to celebrate the visit of King Edward VII. Um, who was um, visiting Bristol to open the new docks at Avonmouth. Um, and it was reported that it was illuminated with 14,000 lights and fireworks. And they were installed by Mrs. Crane and Son from St. James's Bart in Bristol. Um, again, I think this is quite an amazing image as well when you think about how hard it must have been to photograph this as well. So that's, that's quite nice to see that. Um, this isn't such a good image, um, but it's the only image that I've found, um, because I'm working from home at the time, it's only, I'm a bit restricted with what I can actually access to, um, to show you. We might have some better images, but this is um, when the bridge was lit up in 1911 for the coronation of King George V. Um, and again, it was lit up with fairy lights and fireworks. Now, these I've got a nice little bit of reminiscence about the fairy, fairy lights. Um, and this is from the son of Alfred Bamford. Alfred Bamford was one of the maintenance men who worked on the bridge. Um, and his son remembers, this is what he remembers. He says, my earliest recollection of the bridge illumination goes back to 1911. I remember my mother cleaning hundreds of coloured glass fairy lights, which my father used to hang by wire onto the chains. He would then light a little candle in each. And he goes on, by the way, my father used to climb the chains in the course of his work for nearly 40 years without scaffolding, safety rails, wire or the like. 
and he could walk from the toll house at Clifton, up the road chains, through the towers and down and up the bridge chains through the lay tower and down the road chains to the lee side toll houses in seven minutes. Alfred Bamford quite often features in newspaper reports and I think he's quite a local celebrity um, for his um, chain walking exploits. Um, it's quite something to think about all these little fairy lights and I've got a contemporary newspaper account of this event. It says 10,000 lights flamed from every available point on the bridge. A breeze that blew towards the city made the task of those who lit the thousands of fairy lamps a difficult one. It was nearly half past eight when the work of lighting up the bridge in the gorge was commenced. There were about 6,000 fairy lamps on the bridge and buttresses and 200 flambeaux. Over the chains in the centre of the bridge was mounted an immense crown me measuring 20 feet by 15 feet. And this was hoisted into position once its lamps had been lit. On the city side of the Gloucester side buttress, a large GR was mounted halfway up the stonework. The crowds thickened as the lightning proceeded. At 8.30, Mrs. Davis and Bamford performed their arduous and daring feat of walking unprotected up and down the chains to ignite the flambeau and the somewhat tedious work of illuminating the whole scene proceeded to the accompaniment of enjoyable strains of music from the observatory. So I, was, I did a little search and this might be what the fairy lights looked like. So I presume they were, you know, coloured glass little enclosures with candles in and just, I, to be honest, I find it quite mind boggling <laughs> the task that Alfred and the other um, Davis had to do to actually, to actually light them. Um, that seems to be what they did. Um, so electric lighting, I think that electric lighting was installed in the bridge in 1927. This is the only piece of evidence that I've come across. Um, and it, it, these are the contractors, Roush and Penny, or Roush and Penny. Um, and they were paid 24 pounds and 17 shillings um, to install electric lighting on the Clifton side. Um, this wasn't electric lighting right across the bridge, it was just supplied to the toll houses and the lamps suspended from the roach arches in the towers. And there appears to be no other lighting on the bridge at this time. There would have been, obviously in the 1920s, more cars using the bridge, and presumably, again, they would have had their own headlamps. So, um, again, more permanent lighting of the bridge at night time across the bridge doesn't seem to have been installed. Um, however, the bridge was still lit up for special occasions and I think this might have been the first occasion when it's actually lit up across the bridge using electric light. This image dates from 1930 um, when the bridge was lit up for the Bristol French Week and it's lit up with small red, white and blue electric lamps. And it was estimated that about a quarter of a million visitors to Bristol came for that week. Um, unfortunately, it's not in colour. We've got to imagine the colour. Um, it's also, again, lit up in 1933 um, using 1,500 electric bulbs to celebrate Bristol Brighton Week. And in 1935, it was lit up again for um, the Silver Jubilee celebrations. And this time they had double the amount of bulbs, 3,000 bulbs. Um, and the contractors who did that work were the Bristol firm, Colston Electrical Company. Um, the problem with electric bulbs, um, right from the, uh, the, the start of them installing them, was that people basically pinched them. Um, and not only did you have the cost of supplying the electricity and installing it all, you have the cost of actually maintaining it and replacing the bulbs. Um, for this celebration in 1935, it was reported that on average 40 bulbs a week were being taken. And there's a newspaper report here um, saying that um, two men were charged 
with um, stealing a bulb. And it seems to be quite common practice for people just to go up, take a bulb as a souvenir, or just for a laugh, take a bulb or a dare. Um, people quite often took them off and dropped them into the, the gorge as well. Okay, so the, the bridge was also lit up for the Festival of Britain in 1951. Again, the number of bulbs has gone up. <laughs> this time it's reported 4,500 bulbs. But again, 400 were stolen in the opening weeks. Um, the bridge was lit up for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And if you do a little Google search, there's some fantastic footage of it actually being installed that was taken by British Pathé. So if you go to the British Pathé film archives, there's a fantastic clip showing um, men, the contractors, um, right on top of the chains, fixing these light bulbs for the coronation. Again, the number of bulbs has gone up. We've now got 600 lamps, apparently. Um, and this says that the system used six miles of cabling. Again, the bridge was lit up for the centenary of the death of Brunel in 1959, and also for the 100th year anniversary of the bridge, so 1964. So again, 600 lamps were used, and this is um, Charlie Thorne and Derek Phelps fitting them. Um, quite different health and safety regulations to today. Um, but you can imagine the labour involved in even just installing it. Um, from 1967, a more permanent light fitting system was installed, but, and the bridge was lit throughout the summer months to promote tourism and for special occasions such as over Christmas and Easter. But there's still problems with the theft of bulbs and vandalism. And it, in 1967, a youth was charged £10 for removing a bulb and dropping it over the side of the bridge. In 1971, a man was fined £25 for taking a bulb. And it is estimated that during the 21 weeks of the summer, i.e. Um, the summer tourist season in which the bridge was lit, 650 bulbs were damaged and stolen. Um, between... And this shows the, the installation, I think this dates from about 1960s, so it shows the, um, the festoon system of lighting that was installed, even though it wasn't lit permanently throughout the whole year, um, it, should, it gives you an idea of what it looked like. Um, however, in the early 70s, from between 1973 and 1977, the bridge was not lit. Um, and this is partly to save money, um, but also um, it's also to save electricity as well because of the national fuel crisis. Um, so lighting on the bridge um, consisted solely of large suspended lanterns under the road arches of each tower and single lamp standards near the toll houses. It wasn't until 1977 the bridge was lit up again um, between the 16th of May and the end of September, and this was done to celebrate the Queen's Silver Jubilee. The cost um, of installation was £500, and the cost of electricity was around about £1,000. Um, and I can't tell you um, what the cost of vandalism was, um, but it really was a constant problem. This Round about this time um, in the 70s, you had quite a few newspaper reports um, of the, the trustees basically saying, look, if people don't stop vandalising and, and pinching the bulbs, we can't light up the bridge. Um, this just shows um, Mr Edwin Veer, one of our maintenance men, replacing the bulbs. And this would have been a constant job um, for the bridge staff. Um, In 1979, new lighting scheme, well, 1979, 1980, new lighting scheme was installed. And this was a pristine system of 4,225 watt filament lamps. But again, it's really vulnerable to vandalism and corrosion. And it wasn't until the 1990s that a new system was put in, which is called the guide light system. And there we have an image of that. 
Now, this was a system which consisted of tiny incandescent lamps contained in a rectangular polycarbonate tubes. And, that, and you can see how it just traces the outline of the bridge towers, chains, rods, abutment, abutments and toll houses. However, um, while this was, you know, basically there weren't light bulbs to pinch, it was still um, suffered from problems. And this is mainly to do with problems of corrosion, lamp failure, um, connection failure, failures. Another issue is that crows quite often pecked um, at the light fittings and damaged them. Um, and the strips trapped debris as well, which made um, cleaning the rods um, difficult and basically the polycarbonate didn't weather so well and um, the system did suffer from um, erosion. Now this is the lighting that you're familiar with now. Um, so from incandescent bulbs this is actually LED lighting um, and this was installed um, in 2005-2006 um, lit up to celebrate and the Brunel 2200 um, celebrations. Um, and it, this system was designed by Pinager and Partners. Um, and because they are LEDs, they use a lot less power than the incandescent systems. Um, there are 2,796 bulbs. Um, and they're not put on at full power all the time, but they are dimmed at night time to save electricity as well. And I, I will say that um, this system is, well, it's installed about 15 years ago, and it probably has a lifespan of about 20 years. So again, um, lighting is something that, um, I know that it is, it's on the to-do list, the many to-do lists of maintenance of the bridge. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see what new technology um, is chosen to replace this system. Um, um, so we might even be able to install a system where you can just, at the flip of a switch, change the lights at will. Okay, well, that's, that's the end of my little brief romp through the illuminations on the bridge.